Thanks for staying with us on the conversation. On the first half, we dealt with situations in Nigeria where the presidential candidates from 18 political parties signed the peace pact to ensure that there are peaceful elections coming in 2023. And right now, we go to situations where the trial of one of the last fugitives charged over the 1994 Rwandan genocide has opened at a United Nations tribunal in The Hague on Thursday. Felicien Kabuga was often, has often been referred to as the man who financed the genocide, which led to the killing of some 800,000 people in Rwanda between April and June 1994. Kabuga, who was arrested near Paris in May 2020, after 25 years of evading arrest, is charged with genocide and crimes against humanity, including persecution, extermination and murder. Now, wheelchair-bound uh, Felicien Kabuga in his mid-80s refused to appear in person or via video link at the start of his trial on Thursday due to a dispute over his lawyer. But judges uh, ruled the case would go ahead anyway. His lawyers previously argued unsuccessfully that he was not fit to stand trial, but judges ruled in June that the trial should begin as soon as possible, although on the advice of doctors, the trial will run for just two hours per day. Kabuga has pleaded not guilty. During his extradition hearing in France, he described the accusations against him as lies. If convicted, he faces a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Now, joining us to discuss uh, this and more, we have Louis Merge, the Director of Human Rights Watch Central Africa. He joins us from Vermont in the United States of America. We also have Desmas Nkunda, the CEO of Atrocities Watch, who also covered the Rwandan genocide as a journalist, joins us live from Kampala in Uganda. A warm welcome to you, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us on the conversation. I'd like to Thank start you. Uh, with you, Lewis. What's your reaction to the opening of the trial of Felicien Kabuga in The Hague, and why did it take so long? Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, look, our reaction is that it's about time. Felicien Kabuga is one of uh, the big fish. He's one of the masterminds of the genocide, both in terms of uh, sponsoring uh, RTML, radio television Mille Colline, uh, which infused hatred against the ethnic Tutsis across the country, um, and directly in financing the, uh, the Inter Harmway, the youth militia, at the time that was affiliated with the Haber Yamana regime. Um, so, you know, our initial reaction is absolutely this is about time. Um, why has he escaped? Why has he evaded justice so long? Look, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's a question that needs to be asked not only in France, where he was arrested, but across Europe um, and in Kenya as well, where he was rumored to have lived for many years. Clearly, for this Yen Kamuga, who was wanted for many, many years. Uh, managed to evade and escape justice. Uh, and there needs to be a real reckoning and accounting for how this happened, because he couldn't have done this alone. He couldn't have financed his escape alone, and he couldn't have been able to sneak in and out of all these countries uh, without some type of assistance. So I think that's going to be the next big question. Um, but finally, just, just before, you, before, you, before I pass it on, I'll just say it's worth noting he's 89 years old. This trial is going to take a long time. Um, and we sincerely hope uh, that uh, we will have some degree of verdict uh, before uh, Felicien Kabuga dies. You know, this trial could take quite some time. And so we're hoping for a, mm. uh, a free and fair and transparent uh, uh, trial to be sure, but a speedy one nonetheless to, uh, in, to ensure some degree of accountability for the crimes he's alleged, alleged to have committed. All right, thank you, Lewis. I'd like to bring in Decima Sekunde, our CEO, Atrocities Watch. I'm emphasizing on this Atrocities Watch because we're looking at this man, Felicien Kabuga, who is 89 years old, and this Rwanda 1994 genocide is one that has touched a whole lot of people. Now, for the purpose of understanding, what role did he play in the 1994 genocide? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so... Um, covering the genocide, what we learned um, in particular uh, shortly after the downing down the plane that killed the president. Um, Kabuga was a very wealthy man. He was a dealer in tea and coffee, and uh, he did other businesses like transport, and uh, he was well-known financier of many, many 
um, uh, you know, the, 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 the different groups of people, uh, the media he owned, uh, uh, like my, my previous speaker said, he owned the radio station, uh, Radio uh, Mill Colleen, and um, an assortment of newspapers which he used very, very cunningly during the, the genocide to mobilize, to mobilize the, mainly the Interahamwe militias, uh, telling them of various crimes that they would commit, but using some anecdotal language. Like, for example, one of the, the things that he's accused of is rape. And what he used to do in those newspapers and radio would say, uh, would say, for example, quote unquote, go and test that to its women, which was um, a, a signal that they should go and be able to rape to its women. And I think one of the crimes that he's accused of is certainly rape. So he was a financier, he was wealthy, extremely wealthy, not only in Rwanda, but also in the region. And hence his capacity to evade and be able not to be detected, uh, despite the bounty of money that. Uh, the United States had put on his head. So uh, that his role was to finance and heavy mobilization of the Tutsi, particularly the militias, in the commission of the genocide in 1994. Now I'd like to bring in a song, Michael Kumba. He joins us live from uh, Rwandan capital, Kigali. Now a song, what's the reaction on the ground in uh, your home country, uh, Rwanda, where this atrocities took place in 1994? How are the people reacting and uh, what are the general views of the opening of the trial of this man, uh, Felician Kabuga? Yeah, thank you very much for having me on board and good evening to all our viewers. Um, actually, here in Rwanda, we have to understand that um, the genocide that took place is considered as one of the most grievous international crimes. And uh, actually, under the Genocide Convention, um, or also called the Convention on the Punishment and Prevention of Genocide, genocide is defined as any five act with the intention of destroying a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group through either killing them, causing bodily harm, causing conditions that is aimed at destroying them, either destroying, um, killing children or transferring children from one group to another, and also preventing Birds. So in the case of Rwanda, what actually happened was that we have the act of killing the Tutsis, so which was being perpetrated by the Hutus. And one of the main aims of justice is that justice should not only be seen to be done, but justice must be done. So in this context, it is actually very, very important for the perpetrators of the genocide of 1994 to be held accountable for the acts which they carried out. And we know over 800,000 people were being killed. So here in Rwanda, actually people are seeking for justice, but nevertheless, it is worth mentioning that most Rwandans would have preferred that Felician Kabuga should be judged in Rwanda because Rwanda, through its high court, has a chamber that has been created for international crimes. And they work in partnership with the International um, Residual Mechanism for International Tribunals, which is actually a winding up of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So they would have loved him to be punished here or to be tried here. But unfortunately, due to the reasons which were being raised by his lawyers, actually bringing forth medical expert evidence to demonstrate that if he's been tried in the context of Africa, he might not be able to, reach, to withstand the conditions of the trial here in Africa, in Arusha. So automatically, um, it, um, the Hague took upon itself mm. to try him there at the Hague so mm. that um, possibly he may go through the process and be, and be punished. All right, thank you so much, Asang. I'll go back to you, Lois. Uh, while we're looking at Kabuga, you talked earlier on about the age being 89 and this trial opening and all that. Now, one of the major instruments for this Rwanda genocide was the radio, which uh, there were a lot of broadcasts talking about hate speech against the Tutsis, calling them cockroaches and snakes and all that. Now, according to the prosecutors now, they say that Kabuga did not wield, power, wield a machete or pick up a microphone to broadcast hate, but his conduct since 1992 pointed to a consistent anti-Tutsi 
stands. Now, he did not speak on radio. Do you think that the prosecutors uh, have a case, or it's making the case harder for the prosecutors to prove that Felician Kabuga was actually uh, on in this crime because he has consistently denied allegations of being the financer for this uh, radio, of which we're broadcasting hate speech? I think the general consensus on anyone who objectively looks at what happened in Rwanda in 1994 will tell you if RTML, Radio Television Milkolin, had not been propagating its hatred, um, and in particular, a hatred against the, the ethnic Tutsis, um, the genocide would not have been nearly on the scale uh, as, as it occurred. So the fact that he himself was never on the radio um, I think the prosecutors will have a very strong case in, in making that irrelevant. The fact is, um, he was the money behind the principal radio station that not only propagated hatred, but in 1994, when the events were unfolding from April 6th onward, in which people were being massacred, this radio station was actually instructing interharmway militia uh, as to where to find ethnic Tutsis. And, and where to kill them. So um, uh, it'll be, you know, obviously the defense is going to try um, a variety of methods, but um, it'll be a very weak defense if, if their only defense with regards to RTML uh, is that he himself was not on as the radio announcer. He was the financier. Um, he is on the record having been the financier. He is on the record having said that, in his opinion, RTML was propagating simply the truth and the facts. Um, and when you balance what he says about it propagating the truth and the facts versus the hatred that this radio station was spewing and the violence it caused, um, there is a very, very compelling case uh, against uh, Felician Kabuga in that regard. Thank you, Lewis. Now, let me bring in uh, Desmus. Desmus, in a statement released through his son, uh, yesterday, on, on Wednesday, Felicien Kabuga said he did not trust his lawyer but claimed that the court had denied his request to pick another one. Why is this the case? And uh, knowing that these sort of things are happening, is it guaranteed a free and fair trial at The Hague? Um, I, I think the process of choosing a lawyer, I think that is his freedom. Um, and I, I certainly think that he he should be allowed to choose a lawyer that he trusts in terms of the, 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 the trial so that he can get the right defense. Um, if, if he has been denied that, then that one, I, I would believe that it's a, it's, a, it's a wrong move. But on the other hand, it depends on the levels and under which the instructions of the previous lawyer or the lawyer that is handling the case at the moment, how far the lawyer had gone in terms of preparing the, case, the, the defense for him. So I, 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 I don't understand clearly why the family is so up, up against him. picking a lawyer. I think is is certain a natural justice that some someone like Kabuga would want to have a lawyer whom he trusts and can be able to defend him. And I think that is his right. Okay, all right. Over to you, Asong. Looking at the age of uh, Felician Kabuga, uh, he's bound in a wheelchair. How long will this trial take? And even if he's convicted, is it going to be a life imprisonment for Kabuga, who is already eighty nine years old? Yeah, um, of course. Um, the fact that he's, um, he's on a wheelchair um, does not actually mean that he cannot face the, 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 the rigor of, the, of justice. So actually, the justice systems are put in place to repress and to punish. So no matter the condition in which he finds himself, as long as he has mental capacity, he can reason, then automatically the jurisdiction concerned will be able to put in place a punishment that will suit his condition and that will be able to see justice being done. That is him being punished for the crimes which he committed. So I don't think his age is an issue, but yeah, what the justice system is trying to demonstrate is actually justice, fairness, repression for acts which are being considered as the most grievous acts at the level of international law. Uh, thank you. Now, Lewis, in contrast uh, to the progress that has been made in the trying of perpetrators of uh, the Rwandan genocide in 1994, uh, we've seen very few members of the ruling uh, Rwandan Patriotic Front, the RPF, uh, 
they've not been held uh, to account for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, does it mean that the RPF is above the law and uh, is this conversation going on anywhere? Because they also, when they came in, uh, they did commit horrible crimes. Uh, okay. So are they above the law and why is no one talking about uh, this? Interesting and, and an important point. And, and it's, it's important to be very, very clear. Um, the crimes that were allegedly committed by the Rwanda Patriotic Front, um, in particular, the crimes that were committed from July 1994 onwards, they are not in any way in comparison with the genocide. Um, and you will see some people on the international sphere who do try to make a comparison uh, between war crimes and alleged crimes against humanity committed by the RPF. Um, and the actual 1994 genocide itself. They are not the same. They are distinctly different events, um, and there's different levels of culpability tied to each. And I think it's very important just mm -hmm. to sort of make that crystal clear. But to your point, um, there has not been uh, an adequate, in our opinion, Human Rights Watch, an adequate accounting for crimes that were committed by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Uh, the simple fact is, is that tens of thousands of people were killed, um, civilians were killed uh, by the RPF, um, and to date the, the levels of accountability have been very, very individualistic on minor officers, and that was all a justice that was rendered in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, so this is to a degree, while the crimes are very distinctly different, there is a degree of one-sided justice. Um, and to your point, to your question about is this being discussed, well, this is certainly being discussed internationally. It's certainly discussed how the, um, the International Tribunal for Rwanda made a conscientious decision not to investigate RPF crimes. Um, um, so, but, sorry to uh, interrupt you, uh, Lewis. The 2010 United Nations Mapping Report did document uh, some of this RPF crimes. Yeah. Uh, failure to serve justice uh, does lead to a culture of impunity. And uh, we've seen... Uh, what's happening and how this is playing out in the uh, troubled Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, do you think the recommendations of that mapping report uh, will be uh, implemented? And whose responsibility um, is it? Short answer, no. There's, no. there's absolutely no, there's no roadmap right now that will actually implement the recommendations of the 2010 mapping report. The 2010 mapping report, which did have mm. some problems with methodology, but fundamentally did hit on the correct premise, which is that serious crimes were committed by the Rwandan Patriotic Front in Congo. And to date, there has been absolutely zero accountability. Um, I don't see any roadmap at the time being uh, for justice to be rendered for those crimes. Frankly, the only real mechanism that could do it, in my opinion, and the Human Rights Watch's opinion, is some type of hybrid judicial mechanism that actually happened in the Congo to account for those crimes. The mapping report crimes were committed in Congo. The RPF also did commit some significant crimes mm. um, in 1994 in Rwanda as well. Okay, I I'll take this question back to your song. Now we have the Houthis attacking the Tutsis and then the Tutsis taking part and then the Houthis now going over to uh, the Congo and the borders of Rwanda. Now, people are still saying, just like Wenger said and Lewis was trying to highlight that, some of the perpetrators are still at large in DR Congo. Now, talking about justice, aside Palestinian Kabuga, what about the other perpetrators of this Rwandan genocide? Are we, are we confident that the majority of them are also facing, going to face justice? Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. And um, we have to understand that um, when the genocide took place in 1994, from uh, 1994 to 2001, um, the Rwanda, uh, Rwanda actually created a jurisdiction because actually there were two jurisdictions that tried the cases of genocide. So you have you had domestic jurisdiction and you had international jurisdiction. So the international jurisdiction actually tried the top perpetrators, that means those who masterminded, those who mm -hmm. financed, and those who were of, a, were of a certain category. But now, at the national level, you had those who actually um, um, committed these crimes materially, that means those who really took the action to actually perpetrate genocide. So, actually in Rwanda, between two, um, 1994 and, two, and 2001, a special court was created called the Gachacha Court. So the Gachacha Court tried all um, genocide perpetrators, 
And by the end of 2001, when this Gachacha court was dissolved, it had tried over 2 million um, genocide perpetrators. So that's just to say that so many people were being tried, in spite of the fact that some fled to um, uh, um, to DRC Congo. But the truth is that there were many and a very good number were being tried here in Rwanda. Nevertheless, the Rwandan government has been working hand in hand with other countries through their international relations to be able to pick up these uh, genocide perpetrators that are found in different countries and to extradite them back to Rwanda. But you know, that has been a very, very difficult okay. task. And it's just of recent that Rwanda even succeeded in negotiating for um, um, Pelicien Kabuga to be picked up in France. So it's just to try to say that um, um, the Rwandan government is doing a lot to bring back these um, genocide perpetrators and to have them punished. But nevertheless, a good number has been punished here in Rwanda. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to say a big thank you to Lewis Merge, uh, Director of Human Rights Watch Central Africa, uh, Desmas Nkunda, uh, CEO of Atrocities Watch, and also uh, Asong Michael Kumba, lawyer, member of the Rwanda Bar Association. Do you appreciate your insights and contribution to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Okay, this is where we drop the anchor on today's conversation. In the first half of the show, we looked at the situation in Nigeria, where the major political parties vying for the presidential elections in 2023 has signed a peace accord. And we just concluded our conversation on the opening of the trial of Felicien Kabulga in the Hague. Uh, and Benga Aboroa, thank you very much for being a part of the program. And I am Rita Omodia. See you again next week. Bye.